So hi, hi everyone. Uh, so first of all, we want to thank you for uh, coming and for your presentation. It was very interesting, as also the paper. Uh, we are going to present our uh, discussion of the article. Uh, here's Kara Fazlidin, and I'm Naomi. Uh, we are going to first do a very quick summary because you, you already done one and it was uh, enough. And then we were going to propose some critics and question on the methodology. And we tried in the last part to go deeper in the organization layer because as you said, there are things to do in, in that. So as we saw, there are strong evidence showing that uh, yes, there are gender inequalities in gender in uh, patent application, with interesting um, differences between region of the world, disciplines, and also sectors. We put again those two graphs that we found interesting that show the differences between organizations, types of organization, and uh, regions of the world. And this needs a deeper analysis to understand all the layers uh, that uh, are implied in those uh, inequalities. <coughs> and uh, met in, in methodology, uh, the points that we really liked was the uh, three indicators that was chosen, uh, ATL, VSP and uh, WIR. So the methods usually used is the first one is at least one woman per team, which is really a misleading indicator if you look in a long term that we can see much higher participation of women but it's only one so considering the team being consisting of 50 people and having one female does not constitute equality so the paper goes much deeper into the other uh, methodologies, also taking into account the ATL, which is uh, really nice, showing robust results, as uh, you have already seen. And there is a good point where made by industry specialization. For example, not all countries are equally specialized in fields. Some countries may be specialized in fields historically being dominated by male uh, inventors, uh, which shows uh, also robustness of the results. Uh, here is the formula if you want to um, have a look. And then another point was really good uh, observation and also uh, robust results, in our opinion, showing that observed increase in women's participation in patenting was uh, mainly uh, explained by the growth in the size of inventor teams, regard regardless of the gender. Uh, and we want to go a bit more into critiques. I will start with critiques of patenting. Uh, there is a, a lot to be done in academic patenting definition because the literature it does not er argue in one definition. For example, the pa paper uses a definition of the first applicant and classifies this into research institution or, uh, a, a, or uh, otherwise industry or companies. But changing a definition may be uh, looking at the whole uh, number of applicants and distributing equally the, uh, the definition would give much more uh, patents for academia for example. And <clears throat> there is also results in US studies in life sciences, uh, considering number of researchers, uh, the gender patenting gap is much smaller in industry than in academia, meaning the number of uh, female uh, researchers in academia is already low. So the patenting inventors uh, numbers are naturally low, but compared to research, it is much higher. So when we normalize by the number of researchers in the field, industry shows higher participation. And uh, there is classification uh, of patents by inventor method, which is computation heavy and requires a lot of scrutiny over analyzing all the inventors and finding their affiliations, but it can be done uh, because there are many uh, caveats. Uh, for example, academics patents usu patent usually outside their universities and classifying patents by inventor uh, rather than applicant is justified by legal and also institutional peculiarities. For example, there are paper showing uniqueness of university industry cooperation, for example, in China compared to US, uh, saying that uh China, for example, uh, shows much higher uh, patenting by uh, industries and co-patenting uh, does not quite compare to US. And uh, that was already mentioned for, uh, during the 
presentation, uh, there might be an interesting uh, branching of the analysis into star patents, because as was mentioned, patents, not all patents are equal, and not all patents are equally important in uh, being fundamental in the field. So analyzing star patents may give us more perspective in the, in the field. For example, when an analysis uh, of peer and star patents shows that there is a significant disadvantage in peer patents, meaning lower sighted patents, for being a female inventor, but if uh, for female inventors in star patents, for example, there is a very high positive association, both uh, quantity and quality of the innovation output that they make. So there, there might be a huge difference between star patents and the rest of the patents and the trends of gender in, in, in those fields. So uh, now we would also make some uh, specific points about gender. Um, I think by now we all know that gender isn't binary and while we do understand that sometimes you have data constraints we would have appreciated if it would be noted in the paper especially in a paper that aims for gender equality. Uh, secondly intersectionality aspect because gender as we know relates to other categories of an identi person's identity such as for example race, uh, sexual orientation or class background of course there are many more and we also here found a very interesting paper that was just published recently as a draft that this also holds for uh, patenting where the authors look at the intersection between race and gender and also find here that those also in patenting and interact with each other. Um, another point was the definition of inclusivity. We were wondering how you would define that and if you uh, would define inclusivity as a 50-50 parity or if you would also aim for other um, measures for more um, um, access in the, in the field in general. And finally, this is also, uh, we based uh, our uh, discussion mainly on the report we were given. And um, I would say that especially in your presentation, there was way more context and way more uh, policy implication backgrounds. But while reading the report, we were also sometimes missing a bit of context. And we were also uh, trying to do that in the next step and give some outlines what um, else could be done. Um, here the idea was to um, give a bit of a framework of how uh, a more holistic uh, framework could be achieved. Um, there are always different elements of a discipline that can be gendered. And while this is not an extensive list, these are four examples, for example, and we're using the framework performed by Schneebaum. And these elements all also interact with uh, each other. And for example, personnel, which we would now classify as what has been presented today, and publication practices. Here we could, for example, argue or that our publications for, as you also mentioned, that examiners may not even be gender neutral. Uh, here the study also found that, for example, all the examiners were usually more uh, biased, uh, positively biased for all men teams and younger researchers or younger examiners more positively biased towards women. And in um, um, patenting, those two of course very connected and very intertwined. Uh, so we have to consider that. Uh, a third point would be for example culture and environment which has also been argued that uh, patenting in general is sometimes a bit hostile towards uh, women and also that the culture of patenting is sometimes based on very stereotypically ma male attributes. And the last point would be data. The data itself can be biased. And what my colleague has already pointed out here, uh, we would argue there's a difference between uh, if you consider applicants or inventors, and then even the data you're analyzing itself already has gendered biases in it. And uh, to go a bit more in detail, we found really interesting results when uh, an analyzing university data. Uh, so the universities and uh, the various team dynamics in those institutions that were uh, chosen uh, in the research were uh, showing more propensity for women to work among themselves in smaller teams rather than mixing up with men's bigger teams, which was really interesting results for us, uh, uh, which um, required a bit more context for us. So we uh, have a few questions, for example, uh, these institutions are sp um, specialized in some fields. For example, first one is understandably in medical research. Is it in line with medical and personal care specialization of uh, scientific uh, uh, inventions? For example, a bit deeper uh, 
analysis of these universities shows that the uh, former uh, two American Tufts University and Herb University of Jerusalem are much more uh, uh, successful in the uh, clinical, preclinical, and health, also life sciences, uh, sciences according to uh, Times University ranking. But uh, also interestingly, Miami University of Miami is specialized in sort of engineering, uh, would say, fields, atmospheric science, oceanography, which might show us, uh, uh, which might question the result. Is it, uh, does this result hold when we are taking into account industry specialists? university specialization uh, and also is this results of women tending to work in among themselves in smaller teams uh, specific to a country and a research field these are uh, the questions that um, we can look at we can uh, have a robust uh, analysis because it, it is really interesting to to have more uh, more in detail for that and lastly yeah, to finish on this part uh, we found a very interesting book uh, by G.C. Lay on patent law and women. Uh, so she uses, I think, a historical and sociological approach, uh, very global to analyze uh, gender uh, bias in patent law and in patent in general. And so, as you said, and as I think everyone knows, uh, we have gender representation very constricted uh, in society with, uh, I don't know, the situation of women in science, the figure of the inventor of the entrepreneur that is a man and all that. And this can lead to less incentive, as you said, for women uh, to do sciences. But um, she goes deeper, I think, with also a lot of references. Uh, and she, for example, studies the impact of those uh, re uh, representations on law, on patent law, uh, because they, this law were were made by men and they had a, an inheritance of way to structure social roles in society and also they had a certain notion of knowledge of what is knowledge and uh, patent law uses usually binaries such as uh, what the differences between uh, sorry with mind between mind body between public and private or nature culture for example and in the specific example of um, private and public, uh, we I think we know that women were delayed to the private sphere, while men were uh, more in the public sphere. They could be in both, but I mean, the public sphere was for men. And uh, all the knowledge that was from the private sphere was not supposed to be extended to the public sphere, uh, was not uh, supposed to be used in industrial way or in scientific way. So all this common knowledge uh, that is supposed in the patent is not seen as the knowledge that could be from the women. And it's only the common knowledge established by uh, masculine, white and Western uh, people. Uh, so this has an, uh, an impact on what is seen as an invention. And there are very interesting examples in the book, such as uh, two different uh, ways to uh, use contraception to two different means of contraception with one that was uh, that led to a patent and another one that didn't because one was associated with the industrial way to do it to make it so with a commercial um, interest and industrial interest and the other one was seen as something very private because it was a nurse that was apply applying it and sort of that so it shows that um, the two spheres are very different and the way the, um, the the discipline is seen will impact the way it can lead to patents, for example, and this leads to male-dominated fields, such as we saw in the slide you add that was very interested. Is there interesting? Sorry, that male field, um, male-dominated field have higher um, application acceptance rates because they are seen as less uh, innovating or less uh, sorry more innovating or more scientific. So, and um, for the final part, we also have some open questions and just basically to sum up a bit and thank you very much again. I think we all found it very interesting. And the first question we came up with that came up when we were discussing is maybe a bit naive, uh, but I would, I'm genuinely wondering, um, we, we've seen that it's sometimes quite hard to put a gender to a name. Why isn't there a question on an application where people could actually put their genders. <laughs> um, the, sec the, the second question is um, if you could maybe comment on why you would, 
you would say that the re regions differ so greatly because for example uh, for me it was also very surprising also I'm not very much deep into the field but for me it was also very uh, interesting that Europe did very very badly um, so I was wondering if you could maybe comment on that particularly particularly bad um, and the third question would be um, when we were researching this a lot of the literature we found was on core countries like US China Europe and um, so on a bit on Latin America but we were wondering is there maybe um, also more literature on the per peripheral countries which we just didn't find and finally um, a question to you but may maybe also to the organization you're working at um, if which policy would you personally or the WIPO recommend to act actually achieve a more balanced field and with that thank you very much Okay, how much time I have to? Four thirty. Okay, how bad are we doing? But then I think some of them are Three minutes. Do you have another course? Ah, oh, okay. We have one seminar that starts at four thirty. Okay, so very very quick. So okay, first first, not much time. We have another hour. Huh? Okay. Ah, we have one hour to discuss. Okay. Ah, we can fight a lot then. <laughs> okay. No, no, no problem. Uh, first of all, can I get these slides? Yes. Yes. Uh, second of all, do you guys make notes also beyond the slides, or this? I don't know. This is a monographic thing. Have you seen the video? Yeah. If you have something, even if it's raw, it would be appreciated. Okay. First point. Um, what is your? This is this is here, right? Can we go back. Um, let me see, critiques, 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 critiques. Okay, well, a um, few comments. Nice, very nice. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, just for, for all of you that may have paid less attention to the paper like this, because I'm sure these guys have been assessed over <laughs> because of this, so they have to put a bit more attention. Most of the statistics I was showing in my slides are this one, right? Which is, this is basically the share of inventors. So you look the listed inventors, male or women, and you do this. Uh, but as I was mentioning, there are the other two measures. And you're totally right. This ATL, at least one inventor, is the measure that you want to do when you want to impress your policymaker and, and make you look good, because you're trying to measure patterns that have at least one woman. So of course, the scores are much higher. One problem with this measure, which you don't have here, and you have to be discussed, right? But these two are closer to that, is that there's no target. And I'm going to come on this later. So what is the target for a policymaker when you are measuring at least one woman uh, per patent? What is the desirable optimum amount of women in patents? Is like, you know, all patents should have at least one woman. Is that enough? Maybe not, right? If you have nine men, we're still going to be bad. You're still going to get 10% here, right? Uh, is it desirable that all teams have to be balanced? I don't know, right? Maybe it's not always a good thing that they, that they have always balance. But it's balance, which we balance is the weird, the 50-50, but not necessarily impose that to a team. So it's a very bad metric, which I like to connect that to one of the questions at the end about the non-binary. I totally agree. And if you go, we have created for our methodology a guideline for IP offices and government agencies on how to attempt to measure uh, gender. And one of the points that we say is that our dictionary is great, however, it's not good for going beyond binary, right? And we suggest as the main way of looking is adding one extra thing in the, in the things that we don't do at WIPO, we try to do it. We suggested that to the committee of the PCT and they say until member states, basically you guys don't tell us to change, we will not add it, right? Because some IP offices, you have to know, are very conservative areas. <laughs> they don't, they're not the most innovative areas of the world. So they're not very proactive. However, the good news is that in the standards committee of WIPO, they are starting to discuss with countries if in the standard of sharing data, they should not include the, the gender and also at least suggesting that they should have uh, women, men and other, right? Which is a small step uh, forward the, the non-binary. However, what is the target for a policymaker in non-binary measures? 
Because with women, we know that we are more or less 50-50 in the world, right? Despite uh, uh, war attempts to try to reduce that, we still are more or less 50-50 in the world. Um, with the non-binary, we don't know. What, what will be the desirable target about this? We know very little also, have very little demographics in general about non-binary, which we hopefully eventually will have, but we cannot answer that. So it's very hard for, for target. One interesting thing that you guys, you know, by discussing the difference of, of patterns, is that these two measures have uh, many things in common. The difference is that this one is disproportionately computing large uh, list of inventors. So when you're doing the weir, if you have a pattern with 15 ventures, that balanced or unbalanced team is counting more to the composite than this one. And this one is the opposite, right? A pattern that has uh, one, so one inventor will count more than a pattern. So which one is more valuable? A certain pattern with 15 ventures or an entrepreneur in a garage doing a patent? I don't know. Right? You can go either way. But in case you want to exploit that, this is something you can actually do. So more on the critiques. A lot of what's said about pattern is, is clear. The document, I know Francesco Lisoni uh, very well. Uh, and uh, yes, Italian uh, uh, professors, they seem to have sneaked their, te their tech transfer office and filed a lot of patents on their names. Uh, a lot of that is what generated, you may know, in the United States, the Bail Doll Act. The idea that universities actually were owning the, the, the contents of scientific research. There is a big discussion, for instance, uh, people have measured in Chile and Argentina how much of the scientific production is not going to a patent but ends up in a patent of an American applicant, right? Which, of course, for Latin America is a big problem. <laughs> that, um, so that happens a lot. Um, what we have to have in mind is that we're measuring the gender of the inventors but we're attributing the, um, the country of the applicant. So we're using, exploiting the data. The data allows you also to, if you want, to look just of inventors um, of, uh, of a given country and so on. So it's, it's, it's not the data that's limiting us, it's the kind of analysis. WIPO has a long lasting tradition coming from the OECD of measuring a first applicant. This is, uh, to be honest, out of laziness. Because uh, if, if you count only one applicant per patent, your counts of patents and your counts of applicants, they match. So you can e easily verify, it makes your life much easier. But there are a lot of statistics that exploit that and you can look. This being said, I can tell you that less than 5% of the patents have a different country from the applicant and inventor. So it's not a lot. And it's getting probably lower because Chinese patents are exploding and most of the Chinese patents are done by Chinese applicants and Chinese inventors. Um, Moreover, most of those patents has only one applicant. So n I don't think the results are going to change dramatically. What you're going to observe is um, maybe the Barbados, the Virgin Islands of the world will disappear because you're not considering applicants, you're considering inventors. Uh, and you can exploit, we have exploited not for gender, but for other analysis, you can exploit the corridors, right? The corridors of applicants of one country and inventors of another country can tell you about a little bit about R&D outsourcing or insourcing from different countries of different regions of the world. And what will happen with gender on that is an interesting question, right? That is something, for instance, that we are thinking of going in that direction, uh, if any of you want to uh, do this. Uh, this we have mentioned, right? The stars, but all, all, all uh, very... Uh, if I forget something important, please let me know. I know there are other questions I want to go fast. We discussed a little bit about the non-binary. Let me tell you one thing, although, about... Um, about this, many countries are starting to collect data using this. I know, for instance, in Latin America, at least eight countries have included a gender field for doing this. So um, I'm very proud. Interesting, in the same meeting, and I will not tell which Latin American country, the delegates said that they cannot do that in the country because constitutionally, there are only two genders in that country. So if they add this, they will have to go to the Supreme Court and we have a problem. Right? This is how crazy things can go in some countries, so we have to be careful. And in ILO and in WIPO, the discussion of what is uh, inclusivity going beyond binary has blocked the budget approvals by certain member states. So in the research side, we can go crazy and <laughs> have more fun. Outside of that, unfortunately, institutionally, it seems that some countries, some member states, and some people are not there yet. And we need to, to keep discussing it. 
Um, definition of inclusivity, fair enough. Uh, we, we were very simplistic, right? We were talking about uh, the target of 50%, very pragmatic one. A little bit because of what I just mentioned, to avoid certain troubles with some of our incumbents. Um, one of the things uh, is that we are trying to go also for ethnicity, uh, for trying to analyze that diversity. It is very tricky. It's even trickier than names, right? Especially for countries. So in some countries where you have uh, strong patterns of, of people always in the same place, that works okay. But in, in countries with a lot of migration, like United States, like uh, South America, like uh, Latin America in general, like Australia, that is not very informative of it, right? Or it could be not fully informative. So I don't know. I know that people from the UK APO did a great study on this, and they got a red light from the central government said they could not publish it. So it's it's, uh, it's still again coming up. It's interesting. We are not there yet. Um, okay, this has been mentioned, which I took over. I think everything you guys mentioned makes a lot of sense, and we were already trying to address. We will be very, very glad to get more questions about this. Let me see, I don't want to miss anything. Okay, these are interesting cases. It seems to me that a lot of that's still on life science, of what's been discussed here, but uh, very happy to, to give a look of this. This actually is one most interesting one, because it seems a little bit far from the science, but um, shall the Monsieur le Technicien, shall we accept this person? Yeah. And um, uh, I didn't get, an, so if you can explain, there was a mention that I think you, you mentioned something about the sphere of the public and the private, that women were more on the private and men more on the public. That seems against the results of their findings, so maybe it didn't fully understand. It's not academia and private. No, it's, it's more like pri the private sphere. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's a very fair point. And I remember, yeah, you said examples. So there are people who are discussing this. What kind of technologies? And if examiners they they have a, a bias, again, ideas that may come from a different pool of knowledge, right? This private thing. Um, this is something that we like to look. That there is um, certain people who is looking at called I think femtech. Right, trying to look at technologies that are more for the sphere of, of women. Uh, so that could be an approach of looking at that. I don't know, there's something that we, we might look into it. I did mention there was this study done by, by researchers about the USPTO. They were not from the United States Patent Office, but, but they were doing research there. And they tried to see if there was an unconscious bias from the um, examiners. And they did find the result, which of course the, the chief economist of the USPTO contested. They, they, they're not agreeing on the methodology. I personally like the paper a lot, even if I like a lot the team of the chief economist, uh, because I thought they did something clever. I have, I have not tested the robustness of the result, but they try to control for the bias by looking for names that a typical American will recognize as male or female from more foreign names that a typical American will not immediately recognize the gender and try to use that as a control group. I thought it was a smart solution for the problem. And they find an unconscious bias. That way they, they couldn't tell. So the more uncertain is the name, the less likely uh, they will, they will uh, basically refuse the patent if it's a woman, which is an interesting result. Anyways, uh, I, but I agree. I think this is things that had to be looked more. We have a problem with PCT, that you may not, not, not know, but PCT patents are never examined. They have only formal examination because actually PCT patents is just like a, an entry point. And then you have to go with that PCT application and file for a patent in every country with some advantages, like more time, translation already made. But the, 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 the people saying that the patent is granted or not are the examiners of each jurisdiction, what, what you were mentioning. So examiners from DPO, from France, from the United States, from China, etc. Okay. This we just mentioned. Uh, um, and I think, okay, open questions. Last but not least, and you may have others. Uh, wait, this is a question, I already mentioned this, uh, but I think it's very good. Uh, we kind of addressed that a little bit in the discussion representation, right? A lot of that has to do with institutionality and so on. This being said, um, in an early version of all the econometrics I show you, we did a different approach, and we were trying to test that 
if removed the effects of the industry, if, if there was still a country effect, and we find that it still was, like a, not for every country, not equally strong, but there was still something there, there's still a layer that belongs to the country. Is that culture, is that institutionality, is that other things? Even when you remove the academic, right, all these effects, you still find a, 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 an effect there, which is interesting. Uh, we don't find the right variables to go beyond that, but we would like. Um, there is no much literature on the periphery countries. However, as WIPO, what we have found is because of the dictionary and other things, we are observing more and more people in Latin America, in Asia, and other places of the world doing these studies, and we are trying to coordinate and to do workshops in order to learn more what's going on. So that's important. And of course, on policies, it's a tricky thing. However, we did, in the same context, we did actually a whole series of regional seminars, and you're going to find the, those in our website with videos and presentations. And we are mixing three layers. We're having policymakers coming and discussing the policy they did. Of course, what's tricky with policymakers, they always speak about success. They don't like to speak about failures. Uh, then we had a, a more technical workshop with economists and statisticians showing the results. And that's where we, we can tell you that this is a very systematic, our very stylized, our facts. Uh, and we're trying to, to promote a discussion, trying to go deeper. Uh, and then we had something that's super interesting, but is, we don't know yet how to deal with it, is that we have um, uh, meetings with TTOs, technological uh, tech transfer offices, and companies uh, with Chatham rules. I don't know if you know about which basically we can share the information that is said there, but without naming who said what. Um, and we're discussing what were the problems, right? So, because when we discuss with private companies, everybody says, yes, we have a problem. Then publicly, they don't want to <laughs> say they have a problem, right? They want to show statistics, they want to use our dictionary, and so on. But when you are in a closed doors meeting, they're very keen because they know they have a problem, right? And, and they're trying to fix it. Uh, so we're trying to see if, if that knowledge can help us go find other variables, other questions to, to be answered. We're preparing some documents based on this, so something may, may get out. But in that series is where we found this, this about Japan. We have a, um, a, a quite high level official from Japan that was explaining their science and technology strategy on all of, all of this. So we found that very, very interesting. I cannot tell you because I, I, I was not particularly handling that session. Uh, so what was the secret of what they did? But one of the results of all of this is that in that paper I mentioned about the literature review, we're also reviewing the policies and we're going to document all of those policies. Uh, the thing is a humongous task because I think we have at this point like 200 policies. And uh, of course, many of them are hard to assess because they say, yeah, let's do a training of people in this place. Uh, we don't know what's the impact, but at least it's, it's, it's a good start, right? That to, to have a place where to look, a repository of all of this. So uh, I, I know this is a very incomplete answer to this question, but it's at least something in that direction. More questions? Thanks. Hi, I'm Julio from Mexico. Uh, I was just wondering because you, Julio, <laughs> Julio from Me like from Mexico. If you want to cite me, no. I uh, no, no, no. I was just wondering because, like, you mentioned Spain as an interesting case, and uh, like we saw on the graphs that they are like consistently like very much inclusive. And so I was wondering, like, if you have any insights of what they like they are doing right, and also like in the Latin American uh, countries. Uh, I, like, I was wondering, like, why do you think, like, Colombia, Mexico, and like, there was another one? Uh, uh, Most know? Latin Americans are doing quite okay compared to the average. Yeah, compared to, like, it, I, I, of course, I am aware that, like, in Latin America, there are very few patents. <laughs> it's, it, but it's, it's still, like, very interesting. So I was wondering, like, uh, what, what do you think it's being driven by any other question? Madam Chair, shall I collect a few questions or shall I answer every question? I can tell you that. Okay, I will collect.
Hi, I'm Talita from Brazil. Uh, I would like to ask about when you said about intersectionality to segregate the patents by ethnicity or country of origin or family origin or something. Yes, why? I will not segregate by ethnicity, segregate, right? Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Less in translation. And then, uh, why it's not really conclusive to have data by this type of classification in terms of making public policy because I think in other types of public policy it would be really interesting to have this data by this type of information. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> we take one more, I answer and then we take it right if my memory is not that good if not. Okay, I have a question regarding the last graphs you showed, like the two uh, matrices. And so my question, because I'm not totally sure if I understand it correctly, it's basically, it, it kind of is like a network, right? Where you then see which areas are well connected also to other research areas, because you can say that certain patents or that People who apply for certain patents in one field also apply to patents in other fields. And then my reading from that would be that it's kind of clustered and that you have like the typical kind of spillover effect from one industry to another, where you then say, okay, um, a patent in AI can also be used in life sciences, for example, mm -hmm. but it can also be used in manufacturing. So would then a policy be to really focus on like the sectors as with also the um, as you showed with like the distribution by that we see that certain like sci life sciences it's very there are much more applications and then like engineering there is much less so would it then be central to focus on sectors and in like that that would be my question okay Hold with me one second. Let me try to do this. Um, Spain and Latin America. Um, the data indicates, suggests some patterns there, right? And then I will speculate on this to be tested, the second part. Um, what Spain has in common with Latin American countries in a different degree, right? But if you look Spain versus France and Germany, or you compare Latin America with, let's say, Europe in general, and, and particularly United States, you're going to have a pattern where the share of R&D spend, right, or the R&D activities between private and public sector, they're exactly the opposite. In broad trades, you know the United States, 80% of the R&D expenditures are done by the private sector and 20% by the public sector. There are some tricks there, defense and all these are usually not well hidden, but you, you get that, that, that thing. And, Typically, you will expect this to be like a functioning innovation ecosystem that you have a lot being pumped by the government, but the private sector is also very actively involved, right? If you look at how much, I don't know, what IBM or, or Google spends in R&D, they spend more than some nations on this. And, and this is somehow desirable if you have the two of them, not one, the two of them, because there are some kind of... A, um, research questions that they are basic, more general, long-lasting, that is normal that public institutions do, like this one, and there are other ones that are more direct responses to the market, that is good that the private sector picks up, right? So then we don't need to pay with all of our, our uh, taxes. Um, in Latin America, it's exactly the opposite. If you look at the R&D expenditures, you can have 80% being done by the public sector and only 20% done for the private sector. Of course, depending who you ask, uh, they will have different explanations. My explanation to that, to be confirmed, is that actually the private sector is very absent in those innovation systems. Not because they are mean, maybe they are, but not because they are mean, but actually because they can extract rents, they can have a very big profitability doing other things. For instance, I'm from Argentina, you can make a lot of money just by playing the exchange rate. Right? Not doing research. You're, you're not. And actually, I discussed with people from um, one of the big cereal companies there, um, Bunge. I don't know if you know this. And uh, they, they have a headquarters in, in, in Geneva. And of course, our kids play football together. So I was uh, discussing about the election and what's going to happen in Argentina and so on. And he was telling me, for us, all this craziness about the exchange rate 
is fantastic. We're making a lot of money just of this. So of course they're not caring to increase the productivity in the process and logistics by 1%, because they're making 10, 20, 30% just by playing the market with the exchange rates. And they're very sophisticated with that, very innovative if you want on that point, right? Mm -hmm. Not the kind of innovativeness that you would like for a country. That's part of the explanation. There's another part of the explanation, uh, again, with some speculation. I think that in Latin America and Spain, to give an example, they are way more specialized in life sciences because, and particularly if you look at within life science to biotech, because I think biotech is a much uh, lower hanging fruit, despite how, how sophisticated it can be in terms of, of technology. You don't need to build the CERN to do biotech. You don't even need to have a big pharma testing facility and, 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 and scale thing, right? Biotech, it's, it has a lot, especially with all the CRISPR technologies and this, has become much more accessible. So I think it's a very rational decision of the research centers in Latin America in, and Spain to specialize in that. But of course, it's a little bit more of low cost research, maybe with a lot of uh, gains uh, to, be, to be done. But, uh, um, and they're particularly good, right? In, in Latin America, you have very good uh, uh, research on, on agri-related life science. So this is why that specialization, right? P uh, public sector, universities, life science makes that appear. There's another point that I cannot test with my data. I have discussed with other uh, researchers and, and there's something into that. It's not a great one, but it is, Researchers in Latin America, they don't get very well paid. So the salary of, of a researcher is usually the second salary in a household, which for unfortunate reasons quite often ends being the salary of the woman in the household. That's another reason they can be more inclusive. And that's another reason why in general you observe academia being the second salary in household, having a better representation of women. It's not a fantastic answer, right? It's, I think we can do much better than this as a society, but it might be part of the explanation. Should be tested, as I say, right? Speculation. That was question one. Question two, ethnicity. <laughs> so think of John Smith in the United States. Is it English? Is it American? Is it an Australian? We don't know, right? So those ethnicity te uh, techniques, they look at first names and mostly also family names to try to attribute an origin. Uh, when you look at Machado in, in Brazil, is it a Portuguese or a Brazilian, right? Might be second, third, fourth generation, right? And how you, you handle that. So that's uh, one of the tricky parts that we have in the Alvarez and Perez in, in Latin America, right? So that's the, 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 the challenge that, the, that you have to do yeah, with the ethnicity. If it's self-declaratory, you could. Yeah. You can the same for, for gender, but you need somewhere to capture this. Okay. So if, if you go to the guidelines that we that we that I mentioned before, we suggest we, we suggest three methods for gender that are valid also for ethnicity. One is a dictionary. Well actually the first one is collect from the primary source. Put a case there and collect the data. There is a limit on that though that people sometimes don't understand. That you can only do for that moment onwards. You cannot look to the past. Right? So if you want to see if a policy has worked, you need at least two points in time right? to guess that something has changed on that. So you will need to start collecting, wait a little bit of time, and then start producing analysis. So that's where some other techniques can be useful because you can look also backwards, like the dictionary. And you can use the dictionary for gender or for names with the limitations that are mentioned there. There's a third method that actually in Brazil, for instance, you can do it, is going to secondary source. I know that, for instance, the Nordic countries have also great secondary source for this. They do, for instance, employment uh, in Brazil is called uh, RAIS. I don't know if you heard about this. It's a, it's, a, it's a survey that you do to all employers and they have to declare all the employees uh, and a lot of characteristics of the employees, including gender, I think, I don't know ethnicity, I, I need to be checked, probably not. But, uh, but the census does for that, but you cannot connect. But so if you have that source and you have some unique identifier of the company or some unique identifier of the person, you can match with other data, for instance, pattern data, and there you can break that information. That's another way of, of trying to get the gender or ethnicity if you have, uh, in that case, so when you use a dictionary, your data is gonna be as good as your dictionary. 
when you use secondary source, your data is going to be as good as your secondary source, right? That's the, the limits that you have. What was that? Uh, Volkswagen, <laughs> right? So I need to explain the, the, the matrix. Think about this. The amount of women researchers in Volkswagen are related to Volkswagen being from a car industry, or is it because of the uh, disciplines that Volkswagen hires for the team and so on. And that matrix was trying to do exactly this, right? I don't remember, I think here we had, so the Volkswagens were here, uh, the other way around, right? Volkswagen, like this. So uh, the company's fields, so we're, we're comparing uh, Novartis from Pharma, Google, right? ICTs, Pharma, and, and car industries, like this. And we were checking which fields do, are they producing patents? In the diagonal is when Volkswagen is doing a car, car patent, right? That's the diagonal. This is a, a pharma patent, and this is an ICT patent by Google, right? So you are getting here in the diagonal exactly what you should expect. When they are doing patents in the fields that they are actually doing a lot. Everything else out of the diagonal, you were trying to see, well, maybe Volkswagen was trying to see something of you know, bacteria to be used to, to clean some residues in the engine. I don't know, I'm inventing, pulling that out of that place, right? So you're trying to see what's happening here. And then, of course, you're looking if Volkswagen is doing something with Bluetooth or autonomous driving or something like this. Let's look at here. And the same here. Novartis might be doing some research outside of the pharma, and it might, uh, which can be here, and vice versa for Google. So. We wanted to use this as a way of testing what is the primary force for the gender bias. Is it the field where the teams are coming from, or is it the organization where they're working? And very preliminary results suggest that uh, the fields are the stronger force, not the industry. We have not control for many other things, so this is just the big first result, right, to, to be analyzed. But this is what we're trying to look, because we are trying to go a little bit of, you know, what your colleagues were telling us. We have to go deeper and analyze a little bit of those things, and we're trying to be creative with the data that we have. This. The microphone. Yeah. I like the non-linear way you guys uh, get to pass the microphone. That's good, yeah. There's not a... I was actually, I was thinking about the seven layers mm -hmm. in your uh, representation and what you were saying about it being, is it a supply side problem, is it a demand side problem? So in your analysis, you have um, yeah, the various uh, uh, let's say the dimensions uh, you looked at country sector but if you want to go deeper into the mechanisms of for example if you want to understand is it because there are not enough women graduates in some fields or is it more that the environment in a company is toxic so I'm wondering how much of this can be answered quantitatively um, and I think a lot of it has to be qualitative research. So if you can talk a bit about uh, maybe if your colleagues have done similar research and how we can combine the two so that we can have some generalization. Yeah. Should else? I collect other co questions or? Yeah. I'm going to follow up on this as well because uh, you said that you're attempting to make a predictive model with your linear regret or with your logistic regression here but generally speaking when you try to make predictive models you use something like a lasso regression or a ridge regression if you're attempting to do something predictive and that would also have been able to say that some of these uh, factors were maybe unsignificant so uh, that was more like a, a, a you know a model uh, approach to why you chose this specifically yeah okay a third one or Okay, I like because they're very on the opposite extreme, the two, <laughs> the two questions, but on the same topic. So um, I would say that any good research should start with qualitative, right? If you cannot smell something qualitative, there's no way of going measure it uh, uh, there because you're probably, if not just a victim of data artifacts. So I agree 100% that 
that qualitative, and in many cases, qualitative is the only way to go, as there were some of the studies that your colleagues were, were showing there that were very qualitative, right? To approve that. The tricky part of the qualitative, of course, is that uh, you can, you know, only with very eroic assumptions extrapolate that to general things. And that's what we're trying to say, okay, we're using all of this information from the literature that's out there, some of them also very qualitative, and try to see if we can transform something measurable and, and try to go. But I, I, I totally agree, and we had that, again, very imperfect measure of, of the unexplained part, given the variables that we were using, which suggests that you know, there is a lot yet to be disentangled of, of that mess. Um, bridging from, from your question to your question, we are not trying to predict the gender of inventors. We are trying to use that as a way of very imperfectly, I would say, quantify which of these factors seem to be more relevant to explain a big part of the variability. Not to predict the gender of the, of the future inventor, but actually to guide policymakers of where to look, right? And, and also to, to indicate at least uh, um, definitely very implicit in the study that, that they got to see in the PDF, and hopefully more explicit in the study that we're writing right now on the econometrics, is to discuss this idea that this is not a one policy solution, right? You have to, you want to, just okay. React. He might have misunderstood me. Yeah. What I'm just trying to say is that you're going to have a sample bias. You started off with like eight thousand or eight million, whatever, a very large number, and then you yeah. did your, uh, then you're doing your dictionary yeah. thing, and then you're getting a sample bias on that already, and then you're doing an explanatory statistical uh, analysis of this subsample. So already there, you know, the, the the one that you could recognize the genders within, which is a subsample of the larger sample, right? And then yeah. you're then you're trying to explain this and then you're using the results of this. So therefore, I'm saying that if you use a more sophisticated statistical approach within your model, you might be able to remove some of the just general sample bias that has been that have come on their way in your, in your set by okay. sampling clearly. So, well, I mean, a, yeah. so even though you're not trying to predict the future, yeah. I would still just generally say, well, using a more sophisticated approach would have given you better results. Well, I'm just, to be, you know, to be explained, uh, to, It's yeah. a fair point. It should be explored. I, I, I am not sure. Um, I think our sample bias is more about what was discussed of what is patentable and not patentable, right? That's already a big bias there. What you, what you capture on the paper trail of a patent is not necessarily the entire uh, innovative activity of a country. Um, we have a very strong bias being WIPO. <laughs> that is, of course, our member states, the offices, they come to us and they want to measure the same thing, right? They, they don't want to be tapping their fingers for excluding uh, talented women inventors. They are less worried, maybe wrongly, uh, into what talent of women is not captured by the patent system, not, not, not the bias. But um, there might be a bias on the, on the thing, but actually we do quite well on the, on the estimating. When we cannot uh, establish uh, gender, in many cases it's not because of the names that we cannot, it's just because there's no information. If there is incomplete information in the patent. So, yeah, maybe there is a, a bias by, by that as well, but it's not necessarily on, on the method of attribution of gender. I could debate this with you for a long time, if you like, but you're going to have some various uh, estimate uh, trade-off there. You have a bias, a various bias trade-off for your fit in your model. And this is what I'm just okay. really trying to work uh, towards. Yeah. But you will have it with both, both, both sample bias, right? The, Yes, exactly. You could use many different methodologies which did not seem to appear in your strategy. That's what this is yeah. just I'm just remarking on yeah. an econometric, you know, Quite approach yeah, yeah. that would have maybe Fair have given Fair you enough. better and more robust yeah. results. That's it. Fair enough. Uh, you want a question? You, you have a question? Yes, but I think the question of Panandito was not answered yet. Or well, there was some, I missed something of the question? No, maybe. What did I miss? I was asking if, if you can share any deeper qualitative research that has maybe been done by your colleagues or to answer this. That would be uh, by direct colleagues? Not necessarily, just something that you find relevant to, that is recent and... Uh, so, uh, 
We didn't about do much ourselves qualitative, but we have documented why other offices have done. Um, uh, and I think at least we do a better job actually reviewing what others have done uh, in, in, the, in the paper that will come, by actually by LOD is preparing. So I can, I can put you in touch, send me an email, and I can put you in touch with LOD, and she will have a, probably a very long list of, of those. Uh, Thank yeah. you. And some of them are already referenced in the, in the paper, but she has done a, a better job than that paper. Hello. Yeah. I wanted to ask just also a little question of how the methodology works because you said in Europe there's a lot of patenting from the private sector. If like for example... For in Europe there's more patenting from the private sector. More <laughs> patenting from the private sector. So yeah. if VW yeah. does some patenting, how mm -hmm. is the gender assigned? Because I think they also work much together with universities and then they get the patent from the research that some so, students at the university yeah. did and so on. In, in this case, it's very simple. You, we just consider the inventors that are in the patents having uh, Volkswagen as, a, as an, an applicant. It might well be that some of those patents are done with, I don't know, the Max Planck or whatever, right? And we will count those inventors too. Right, because we actually, it's, it's not easy for us to know which inventor belongs to which co-applicant. Uh, so they, they're going to be implicit there. What we are not capturing, that was mentioning uh, a little bit on, on, on the comments by your, your classmates, is that sometimes a company will buy a, a patent from a research team, will have a license of that. That we are not capturing here. Right? You need to have these companies named as, as applicant or co-applicants of it. Um, so, yeah, and then that, okay. <laughs> proximity, I think pro proximity got the best of you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if you uh, think that there's like anything specific to patenting that is different to other like sectors concerning gender inequality because if I understood you correctly, you said that there's still like a lot of reasons that you like need to find out why we have see that. But then do you assume that these reasons are different to like why women are underrepresented in many other fields? Like what is specific to patenting? Uh, actually, I can tell you what's not specific of patenting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are doing a study that's almost published uh, on industrial designs. And most of the stylized facts that we're finding here not exactly, again, every digit, but we find a very similar results. What is that? Again, not a parity, improving over time. Results are better than for patents. So there's more participation of women in industrial designs as creators, right, as designers of those industrial designs. A lot of variety on the industries that file for industrial designs and kind of like the, the very stereotypical results you will expect. So Industrial designs related with um, pharmaceuticals, perfumes, cosmetics have more women. Those related with weapons and, and, and mechanical things and so on have more men. Um, uh, what else were on this? Also diversity across countries. We have just found an interesting result because the, um, the EU IPO, you may know the, um, the EU IPO is the, um, the former OHIM, right? The, um, uh, Office for Harmonization of the Internal Market, I think it was what it was called before. They handle, the, they're the equivalent of DPO, but just for the European Union on trademarks and industrial designs. And they just did a study of women participation on their designs, on their, the, the, the community designs. And there, Spain was really bad. And in ours, Spain was really good. And we we're talking the two teams, is okay, one of us got it wrong. Right? How is it that we're getting exactly the opposite results? And we check it, we check it, we check it. And actually, when we uh, filter our data to only their data, we get the same results. While we use all the designs, we get uh, Spain much better. And this is because the applicants, they do not use the different systems in the same way. So in general, for the UIPO, there is a selection of larger companies, larger in this case, larger um, uh, design company, if, if you want, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you call this? Uh, 
bureau de design. You know, this, 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 this big things like an architect, like a cabinet of, of, of designers. Uh, they, the larger they are, the more they're going to go for there. Well, the more independent ones, they will use the domestic of Spain and, and other like this. And uh, this is one interesting, very different result that we're finding for patents. While for patents, we find very systematic results, regardless of, of, of the level. If they use PCT or they do not use PCT. So that's one interesting result. However, everything else, very, very similar. Another difference with designs that we find is that it was getting better until 20%. When it reached 20%, it plateaued. And I don't know. We don't know why it has plateaued. Right? A little bit might be China entering there as well. It's starting to use in the system a lot. Uh, so everybody's converging to, to the big part of China. But, uh, but it seems there's something more. Uh, and that could be problematic. Because patents have not reached there. We're still in 16%. Does it mean that when patents reach 20%, it's going to plateau and we're not going to keep improving? So that, that could be an open question. I was wondering if you thought to use network science to give more ah, of the That was a question. Who was? No, that was a follow up of your question. Yes, sorry, I forgot to answer that part. Uh, because you showed a lot of things that we barely saw. Yeah. Uh, so, so many colors, different colors. Yeah. But have you thought to like put it into network science so, so it's more or less clear? Yes, although I haven't <laughs> used it yet. Because I and just checked, there are a lot of basically publications that are using network science when it comes to yeah. patents. But, uh, yeah. So, that connects to what you were asking, and I didn't answer that part. Apologies for this. So, in this chart, we were not looking at networks, but you could, right? So, one thing that you could actually do, instead of looking at just the portfolio of Volkswagen or just the portfolio of artists, you can see what are they citing. And what they're citing might be in other fields. Uh, and you can try to see if usually teams that are more balanced or with more men or more women, if they cite more men or women technology, if there's any kind of bias like this, right? This is something that can be explored. It's in the pipeline of things to explore, but uh, we have not yet done it. But, but you can definitely do it. Um, you have to know, or you probably know, that citations in a patent is not like citations in a scientific paper. They're not necessarily introduced by the team doing the research. They can be introduced by the lawyer, the patent attorney, generating this. And actually, most of the citations are not even introduced by the lawyer, with one exception that I can discuss in a second, but they're introduced by the examiner. right? And, and you can have um, citations um, that they introduce on, on, on the first examination, just before publication, uh, which is not a non-binding examination. Or you can have citations that are entered during the examination that granted or not. The beauty of those citations is that they also they tell you if they're just citations of prior art, meaning that this technology relates to the, the previous technology, or actually citations that says this, the, the, the prior art actually kills the novelty of this patent, or partially kills the no novelty of this patent. This is something that can be exploited. Uh, again, the tricky part is that you, you need to make assumptions of how much the team knew about this or not. Right? So that was a bit tricky. But yes, you're totally right. You could compute. Um, network related indicators to add it in the model, or you can do a completely different analysis, which is about uh, network and so on, a different model, a different thing, and so on. You, you could, yeah. One thing that we didn't mention, it was implicit in, in the discussion, or, or maybe even explicit in the discussion of the, of the colleagues, is about productivity. We didn't that we have not fully disambiguated inventors, we cannot easily know who are the stars on the stars. That was one of the elements. And we cannot then test. But they have, have people who will actually look at this, trying to see if the productivity of scientists and of inventors is affected or not in terms of gender. And particularly, most of them, they find that once you actually control for maternity leave, for many other things, there's no different productivity, or even women are more productive. So they, that's this um, very interesting things. Case study. Remember a cool case study, actually, by Annalisa Xenian, uh, discussing Silicon Valley, qualitative one. Uh, she tried to document how the, the Silicon Valley was actually a very toxic environment for women. 
because given the long hours that the, the, the entrepreneurs creating the startups and eventually becoming CEOs was something that was completely alienating women to participate there. So that, that became the very macho culture that then you observe all the scandals of the Uber and so on and so on. So that's another one interesting that, that I just remember that you might find. Uh, yeah, you we should. Yes. Bless you. <laughs> so, no more questions? No? So, thank you very much.